Good morning, Denby. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And good to be in Denby. Come back a yard. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning and it's good to be here. Um, I would have been here earlier, but I took my eyes off the road for one second and passed the turning uh, on a fancy road now. So uh, I end up coming off over by um, Clarendon Park. Yeah, far. I had to come back here. So I felt like I was in, the, in, in foreign because, you know, foreign when you, you miss your turn. It's a long drive before you get back to where you're going. But God is good. I'm here this morning, and I'm happy to be here with you this morning to share in the word of God. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in um, St. Catherine, Portmore Gospel Assembly, and also my family, um, my four girls. Um, one of them married and gone leave, we know, so it's only two leave. Rebecca is no longer Reed, she's Henry. So when you say her again, don't call her Mrs. Reed. Miss Reed, it's Mrs. Henry. But, but um, my wife would have wanted to be here, but she had something to do this morning. And um, she wouldn't have been able to come. But uh, I want to share with you from the word of God this morning. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter... Six, and while you do that, I'm going to ask your uh, indulgence for a few minutes after we are done. One of the reasons I'm here this morning is to do an evaluation on your pastor. Um, I am given the task of doing an evaluation exercise. It's something that we do in the association on our elders, and as you know, all um, pastors are elders, but not all elders are pastors, like Ella Melvin Patrick, he's an elder, but not a pastor. You with me? Um, I think Melvin is um, young, that's why we're not doing the evaluation, then. but next time we're doing it, it will be pastor and um, brother um, Ella Melvin uh, Patrick who will be evaluated. So I'm going to ask you for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, the exercise won't be long. Uh, we'll do that uh, on the pastor this morning, and we'll get that out of the way. Amen, church? Amen. All right, so if you're with me, Mark chapter 6. I'm going to be reading a few verses from 45 to 42. And in reverence to God's word, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read. I read and you follow Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through to 52. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up to a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oar because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This is the word of the Lord. Remain standing as we pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. 
And it is our prayer that as we hear your word, it will go and become like fertilizer for a heart that is receptive to your word. May we, Lord, not just hear, but may we put into practice that which we have heard. Indeed, our desire is to become more like you. And therefore, what we hear now, Lord, may you use it in our journey to become like our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are here who do not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today they will make you their choice before it is eternally too late. And may as we leave here, we may say one to the other, it was good for us to have been here. May your word now be used to glorify your name. And this we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to ask you a question this morning as we contemplate this passage before us. And a question that I'm going to use this text to try and answer uh, as we deliberate on what is before us. And the question is this, why does God put us in impossible situations? Why does God allow us to go through impossible situation that sometimes to us, when we look at it, it makes no sense to us? Why does God allow us to go through things that seems impossible and in the time that we're going through it to us makes no sense? Abraham, if you remember, was um, going through this kind of a situation when God told him that he must offer up his son Isaac. Didn't make any sense because Isaac, you remember, was the promised son. Isaac was supposed to be the heir of the covenant. And Isaac must, uh, uh, sorry, Abraham must have been thinking to himself, if I, if I kill him, there will be no heir. If I sacrifice this boy, where is the covenant or how is the covenant going to be continued? He's a single man and he has no offspring. How can he be heir of the covenant and you are telling me to kill the boy? Makes no sense. Not only that, but you remember Israel also when God told them to leave Egypt and go to the wilderness. But the Bible said he had them caught between Pharaoh on the one hand and the Red Sea on the other. And between them were mountains. And the question that they were asking Moses and they were terrified what was going through their mind. Lord, did you bring us out here to kill us? This doesn't make any sense. Similarly, I want to ask you, what do you do? What do you think? What do you say when you go through times that to you seems impossible? What do we do when God places us in a situation that makes no sense? I want to this morning use this text and try to answer that question. The text that we just read, Mark chapter 6 and verse 45 through to 52. I want to make some observation from the text that we just read to try and put this story together in answering this question. You remember the scenario here when Jesus um, said to them, gentlemen, get in the boat, go over to the other side. They had just come out of a miracle. You remember the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus said to them, get in the boat, go over to the other side. I want you to think about this, that when Jesus said that to them, these men were in the will of God. 
Work with me. They were in the will of God because Jesus himself said to them what? Get in the boat, go over to the other side. They were in the will of God. In other words, the only reason that they were on the sea is that they were doing what Jesus told them. The only reason they were crossing over in a boat is that they are obeying what the Lord said. They are being absolutely obedient to the word of God. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we can be in the will of God and some things that happen to us don't make any sense. That's observation number one. They were in the will of God. God tell them to go into the boat and go over to the other side. The second thing I notice from this text, if you are reading it with me, is that sometimes obedience brings storms. Sometimes obedience brings storm. Wouldn't you know it, my brothers and sisters, that in the middle of their obedience, a storm broke out. I wonder if that has ever happened to you. That while you're trying to obey God, while you are trying to do exactly what God has told you to do, storm break out. The text says that a storm broke out and uh, while they were obeying God and all of a sudden they discovered that obeying their Lord can lead to stormy sail. Because we have this thought sometimes that if I am obeying God, I should not be going through problems. If I am obeying God, then everything should be all right. Worst of all, if I'm in the middle of God's will, then I should not have any problems. The text before us tells us that that's not true. Because these men, the only reason they were in the boat was because Jesus told them that. And in obeying Jesus, they found themselves in a storm. They discovered that listening to the Lord, submitting to God's voice, obeying his word can lead to stormy conditions. Don't miss that. The next observation I think I want to make from this text is that this, the, the disciples' situation gradually got worse. Look at the text. Now, it's, it's bad enough that they are in a storm. We are told that they are in a storm and they are in the will of God. But the Bible says also that they were straining at the oars. That means that they were doing everything within their human capacity to do what Jesus says they told them to do. Jesus said, go over to the other side. They were straining at the oars, meaning that they wanted to go left, but the wind was pushing them right. They wanted to go forward, but the wind was pushing them backward. And they were using every possible strength that they had to do what the Lord told them. Not only that, but it gets worse. We are told that it was about the fourth watch of the night. And the fourth watch of the night is anywhere between 3 and 6 o'clock. You know what that tells me, my brothers and sisters? It did dark. It was dark. I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where there's absolutely no light. I remember one day, don't judge me, I remember one day going through Fern Gully. We don't get to go through Fern Gully again because of the new highway. But I was going through Fern Gully and I said to my wife, I just want to see how dark in here is. Oh my God, why did I do that? I just click off the light quick and turn it off. And my brother and sister, I couldn't even see my hand before me. It was that dark. Think about it now. They are on the sea. The only light they would have gotten is from the stars. It was dark out there. So, so watch how their situation is gradually getting worse. The wind is blowing them in the opposite direction. They are using every possible strength that they have to try and go against the wind. And not only that, it is dark. 
Meaning that they don't know where they're going. They can't see. But watch this, my brothers and sisters. It gets worse. Because we are told that they are in the middle of the lake. Now, it would have been bad enough if they were one third of the way. Because they could have turned around and go back. It would have been bad enough if they were two thirds of the way. That means they would have just row one third more and then go back home. But they were in the middle of the lake, meaning that it would have taken them the same distance to go back than to go forward. They were in the middle. Going forward would take the same strength. Going backward would take the same strength. They are in the middle of the lake. It's dark. They are straining. The wind is blowing against them. And they are in a storm. I don't know if you are seeing where I am getting at. Because sometimes we can be in the middle of God's will. And a storm comes. And not only a storm comes. But it gradually gets worse. Things get from bad to worse. I remember when I was in the hospital and I went in there for one thing and then something else happened and then something else happened and then I developed a heart problem and then a kidney problem and the doctors then begin to look at me in a kind of way like, boy, you know, we can't do film now, you know. And listen, when you go to the doctors and the doctors them tell you that they don't know what else they can do. As we say in Jamaica, you can't dark. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know, my brothers and sisters, if you have ever been in a situation where things get gradually worse. Things get from bad to worse. That is what the disciples found themselves in. They were in a situation where things was gradually getting worse. I believe that some of you are here who are here this morning are probably in such a situation. You're in such a situation because you might, you might have heard some news from the doctor or you are hoping that some kind of monies would come to help and it not come in and then you hear that the source that you normally get it from can't do it again because their situation get bad and not only does the money not coming but the persons them who want the money knocking at your door. So there is their situation. What to do, where to go in the middle of a storm. But I don't know if you realize when we read the text, it says that Jesus was on the land and it says seeing them straining at the oar. Don't miss that. Seeing them straining at the oar. Now, how is that possible? Jesus had left them to go to the mountain to pray. They were in the sea. He was on the land. But the text says, seeing them straining at the oar. Not only that, it was dark. It was stormy. But the text says, seeing them straining at the oar. My brothers and sisters, what this is telling us is that God is well aware of the situation that you're going through. God is well aware that you have been caught in the middle. God is well aware that you have been trying to do his will. God is well aware that you can't see because it is dark. You don't know what to do, where to go. It's like that king in the Old Testament says, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. And God is well aware that you're tired. Remember when it comes to God, the light and dark are alike to him. So just because you can't see, don't mean God can't see. Just because you don't know what to do, don't mean God don't know what to do. Just because you are straining, doesn't mean that God has no strength. As the text tells us, the Bible tells us, not not there. That's how the Pato version read it. Not not there, where God can do. 
We are told just as, as a passing statement that Jesus had gone to the mountain to pray. And I wonder, I wonder what Jesus was praying when he was on that mountain. He probably was praying for his disciples to pass this test. And that's exactly what it is. Because watch this, my brothers and sisters, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through storms because he's using the storm as a test. He's using the, the storm as a way to move us to a different level. Be careful sometime when we pray you now. Lord, I want to go to higher heights and deeper depths. But guess what? Through the road that takes you to the higher heights and the deeper depths is a storm. And the Lord allows us to go through the storm because he wants to bring us to that level. But to get to that level, you have to go through the storm. Notice the text says in verse 48. Look at it. It says, Jesus came to them what? Walking on the sea. Don't read that too fast. Jesus came to them walking on the water. But, but, but I thought it was a storm. Isn't that what the text told us? It was a storm. I thought that in a storm, the water turbulent. I thought that things were out of control because... Uh, we are in a storm. So, so evidently, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is walking on the very thing that is causing them their deepest concern. Jesus is walking on their problem. Jesus is walking on top of their circumstances, on top of their difficulty. Jesus was coming to them on the very thing that was causing them concern. They were looking for a solution, but the solution was on top of the problem that they face. The text goes on to tell us in verse 49, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost. Wouldn't you? This don't happen normally. Because we're in, these were, remember, you know, these were, most of them in the boat were professional fishermen. Them kind of used to the storm. Them kind of used to the turbulence. They kind of used to what's going on in the boat. But what they have never seen before is, is a man walking on the water. And the Bible says when they saw him walking on the water, they said, why? A ghost. You know what, my brothers and sisters? They were not looking for Jesus. They were not looking for Jesus because many times when we go through our problems, we, our eyes are more on the circumstances than it is on the Savior. Our eyes are more on the sea and the turbulence and the problems more than the Savior. That is why it says they didn't recognize him. They didn't see him. They don't owe oh, this a ghost. And many times, my brothers and sisters, Jesus wants us in the middle of our problems to take our eyes off the problem and put it where? Put it on the Savior. Fear had replaced for them faith, blinding them to God's presence. And I think that is the problem many times with us when we go through some, some, some problems that we hear that, that we don't have the answer to. Our eyes are blinded because God, God can do it. 
and we forget everything that we have been taught we have been, we have forgotten everything that we have gone through before because if you remember my brothers and sisters the text tells us that just two chapters before this jesus had told them let us go over to the other side but this time jesus was in the boat and jesus it said when he told them let us go over to the other side jesus got sleep it said he said he was intended to intending to sleep because it said he went and he put him head on a cushion no hear me now when you want sleep and you see jesus put his head on the cushion that means he did want sleep because if you read the text before you now jesus had a busy day he was healing he was preaching he was doing all kind of things he was tired so when he got in the boat the man got sleep but what they forgot is that jesus said let us go over to the other side if you forget everything else i say this morning remember this if jesus said we're going over we can't go under if jesus says we are going over we can't go under it was jesus who said to them go over to the other side now if they had learned that lesson from that experience it would mean that when they are going through the same situation but hold on they will never go through this last week and 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 jesus take us over jesus did same we're going over to the other side we're cool man but but before you point your finger at the disciples remember four pointing back at you because we are like that last week jesus took out out of, out of something last week he provided last week he did something very good for us and just this week we're going through a similar situation and we ball out why and we forget what he did just last week and you know what even if he never do it for me last week and him do it for you last week me i go say if him can do it for you then him can do it for me too the text tells us that their eyes were not on the savior hence they didn't see him but i don't know since if you realize this it says in verse 48 it says jesus intended to pass by them in other words the question is are you going to respond to my presence or not that is what you know so jesus was going past them and and he wanted to know what are you going to call out to me are you going to make me pass verse 51 says then he got into the boat with them and he says the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished they were utterly astonished don't miss that they they were utterly astonished as jesus stepped in the boat the wind stopped this must have brought back to them the picture of what just happened last week because when jesus got up and he said warm to no man on the freight sir peace be still the storm winds that was blowing and was turning over the boat and water getting when jesus said just put it in our language jesus said to the storm just cool no man hold your peace quiet yourself and he said the star it the, the water was so still when he got into the boat the same thing happened this must have reminded them about last week when this happened the wind stopped when they when 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 the proximity watch this of 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 the savior 
closed. So when Jesus was far, they were going through the storm. When Jesus come near, the storm stopped. The wind came when there was distance. The wind stopped when there was closeness. What God, I believe, was doing, he was using the circumstances to draw them closer. I hear this, my brothers and sisters, sometimes that is what God has to do. Because, you know, the truth is with us, taught the truth now in a church. When things good with we, when things good, the prayer life not the same, come church when we feel like, read the Bible if we want, and we just cool off of the Christian life. But when things start to get rocky and shaky and stormy, that time, that time you, see, you start to see certain people come to church, you never see them. You can't tell when some things are going with some people, you know. Because when things good, you don't see them. But when things bad, you see them in a church, you see them in a church first Sunday, you see them in a church second Sunday, you see them in a church third Sunday, you see them in a all Bible study them come. All prayer meeting. Where well, them don't normally come. You know things are going. Sometimes because the Lord wants to pull us close, he allows problems. So you know what, my brothers and sisters, I am I am wondering if if we prayed right when we're going through storm what is our first prayer when we go through storm lord stop it lord move the wind die down the wind don't you talk the truth no man die down the wind lord move this storm but perhaps the prayer might be in the storm lord what are you doing in this storm What is it you want to accomplish in this storm? Because for them, he wanted them to draw closer. Hear me then, my brothers and sisters. When God have you in a situation and nothing is changing, that means that he doesn't intend for it to change until a new level of intimacy occurs the text says then he got into the boat and the wind stopped and they were utterly amazed you know what their problem was my brothers and sisters it's in that little word in verse 52. Look at verse 52. Verse 52 says, For, what is that word? That's first word. For. It explains to us why they were utterly amazed. Hear the text. It says, For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. Now, if you're reading this, your first question is going to be, what is he talking about? But you remember the incident of the loaf happened just a few verses up when he fed the 5,000. And don't you know what happened there? The feeding of the 5,000, a little boy come with some fish and bread and Jesus turned the fish and bread and fed 5,000 people, men. And you know where 5,000 men there, more women there, there. And if women come, them and carry them children, a whole heap of people there, there. And Jesus fed all of them so much so leftovers. Not just one basket, it's a 12, whole heap of food leave over. And you remember what happened? Jesus was giving out the basket to his disciples. And as him come to Loretta and Loretta take out the one fish and the piece of bread, and him said, don't know. As she took it out and the bread and the, and the fish, 
and as him looking there, more fish, more bread, and him say, wow, and him go to somebody else and him take out, and you know we, you know we if a Jamaican did there. Say, so even though we go, mama never come, and papa never come, so me I carry for them too. Tell the truth, man, that's how we stay. I remember seeing a picture of a lady going to a funeral. And she eat for her food at the, at the repast, you know. But she have one big bag. One for mama, one for papa, one for him, one for... She have about 12 food in the bag. But every time the basket came, watch this. Every time the basket came, it full again. And the, and, the, and the disciples must have been saying, Whoa! So much so that when they got in the boat, can you imagine the talk? You see what go on a while ago? As, the, as, the, as my basket finished, it full again. This was designed for them to see Jesus differently. It wasn't for them to just ooh and ah over the miracle. And I want to hear that again. When Jesus do miracle in our life, it's not for us to ooh and ah over the miracle. It's for us to see God differently. It's intended that they would have seen Jesus in a different way. That he was a miracle worker. That not in a day where him can do. But the Bible said they were utterly astonished when he got in the boat because for they did not learn the lesson of the loaves. They did not connect the dots and say, hold on, hold on. If him multiply them little fish and bread and feed 15,000 people, me I say a whole heap of people there, 15,000. And if last week, him did just say to the storm, peace be still. This is an ordinary man. But you know what the Bible said? They did not understand the miracle of the loaves. It means that they didn't see Jesus for who he is. And sometimes God put us in this situation because he wants us to see him differently. For us, Jesus is just teacher. Or for us, he's just this. We don't see him as God. We don't receive him as he really is. The wonderful working person that he is. And he brings us into situations sometimes that he wants us to see him differently. I wonder if the situations that you have gone through, have you seen Jesus differently? I wonder if the situation that you're going through now, what you have gone through before and what he has done for you, are you going to see him differently? Are you going to understand that this Jesus is no ordinary Jesus? And, and, and if you have gone through it, are you going through it? Are you not going through it? No. Hold on. You soon go through it. Because that's how life is. Problems are inevitable. So when you go through your situation, how are you going to see God? You know, for some of us, for some of us, God only come in when we do everything we can do. You remember they were straining at the oars. They were using all of their strength. God only come in for us when we do everything we can do. And at the end of the day, when everything we can do, we call overseas, send some money to the person saying, can't send it because it now work. And you call Matty and you call this and you call that. And nobody now say nothing. And you say, Lord, help. You know, you call upon the Lord after you do everything you can do. And you know the song already, when everything else fails. Hear it now, hear it now. When everything else fails, try Jesus. Wicked song. My brothers and sisters, you don't try Jesus when everything else fails. You try him first, 
you try him second, you try him third, you try him fourth, call upon him first. What God wants to do, my brothers and sisters, for us is to build our faith. And if we begin to doubt Jesus like these disciples, if we begin to worry because we have some people in here and are calling the name and are looking in the face and are even pint down to me, I pint up so. Next thing you say, may I preach for you? You have some people who they are professional warriors. Don't they? Talk the truth in a God church. We worry. And you know what worry says? Worry says, God, I don't trust you. This is too big for you. You can't handle this. Don't you remember, my brothers and sisters, what the Bible says? For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what, seek him. The text says, let's run on quickly. It says that when they came into the boat, these now, this, text, this text that we just read in Matthew, Mark, there is one parallel to it in Matthew, and there is one parallel to it in John. The story in John, the last part of it, watch it what it says in verse 21 of John chapter 6. It says, so they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately it says, the boat was at the land to which they were going. The, the boat was immediately at the land they were going. But Mark told us, remember what Mark told us, that the boat was in the middle of the sea, you remember? The boat was in the middle, but John says immediately as Jesus got into the boat, the boat reached shore. Immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. What is the point here? The closer you recognize Jesus in the middle of your impossible situation, the sooner you arrive at your destination. Some of us going through our difficulty long time. You know why? Because you're not recognizing Jesus. And the thing sometimes with God tests, you know what with God tests? Because he wants to get us to a new level. When we don't pass the class, you can't skip it. And say, you didn't do the class already, so you're not do it again. His class is you have to pass it before you move to the next class. And if you don't pass it, you have to take back the class. And you continue taking the class until you pass the test. And sometimes some of us are going through the same thing over and over and over. Why? Because you're not past the test. The closer you recognize Jesus in the middle of your impossible situation, the sooner you arrive at the destination he's planning to take you. So, my brothers and sisters, when we go through our impossible situation, it is because God is doing something in us to move us to a next level. And sometimes he has to use problems. Sometimes he has to use difficulties to move us to that next level. So the next time you're in your situation, don't ask why. Ask the Lord, what is it you want to teach me in this? Because God wants us. You know, ultimately, <laughs> I've said it in this church before, you know. Ultimately, God is more interested in my holiness than he is in my happiness. Ultimately, God is more important in getting me to look like Jesus than he is with me having a smooth seal right to glory.
Because many of us think that when we come to Jesus, it's supposed to be smooth sailing all the way. No choppy seas, and you just, you just in the, and, and some of us believe that we are in a cruise ship, and we just step on the deck, and we kick back, and relax, and that's so how we are going to heaven. No storm, we're on the deck, we are sip a nice glass of lemonade, and we just, we just kick back and relax. We just duke off and we cool. But the only time you read something like that is in a story that begins in a land far, far away, once upon a time. Real life don't go so. I don't have to tell you my story. You know my story. But in the middle of it, the question moved from why. Because I'm not telling you stand up here and tell you I didn't ask God why. Why is it that you have me going through all of this? But it reached a stage where it moved from why to God teach me. And, and, and kind of looking back now on this side of it, when you can turn on and look back on this story, you realize that God was doing some marvelous things. Brothers and sisters, there are some people that I got the opportunity to talk to about Christ. In my wildest imagination, I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity to tell doctor and nurse in a big, big hospital like that about Jesus. Go back to the Bible. Because you remember Paul was chained up between Roman soldiers. You remember, don't it? He was chained up between Roman soldiers and we said, Lord, what a waste. But it is during that time it said those soldiers were, the, the, were near to Caesar. Them soldiers, they are big men. And God had Paul, the worst thing you would have want is to chain up beside Paul. Because if you chain up beside Paul, you're going to hear the gospel. And the Bible said many of the Praetorian guards came to Christ. God worked differently from us, see? So I say to you as we close, when you're going through your situation, remember, God don't leave you now forsake you. He's right there. He wants you to come closer to him. And in doing so, he wants to move you to another level in the intimacy and the relationship with him don't take too long to learn the lesson come to christ quickly learn the lesson and when him do the miracle for you this week and something else look like that come up next week don't forget last week because the same god who get you through last week can get you through this week amen I don't know what's in store for us this week, but one thing I know, God is there. And if God is there, we can smile at any storm. Bow your heads with me.